Um, how's everyone doing? Yes. Amen. One said he, she's blessed, <laughs> and then the rest of us are Bless. blessed. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> um, the Lord has a, a good word for us today, and, and it's kind of um, funny how it came to me. Um, we were in a conference over two weeks ago. You guys uh, remember that we were not here, most of our, uh, the staff, because the Lord is so gracious after, I don't know, over, maybe over 10 years ago, uh, or even more, uh, the last time we all went together as leaders to refresh ourselves and to seek, you know, um, um, be refreshed in our soul and also uh, be ministered to. And so, and uh, this time when we, uh, we had a great time, and we thank you for all your prayers. Of course, we always have a great time. Just our fellowship is already great. <laughs> Just hanging out with, with the people you love to hang out with is, is a great thing. Um, but anyways, this, this time, you know, I had a kind of a mix, if you will, a mix uh, emotions or something like that. I was, I was inspired at the same time. I was kind of frustrated. You know, the, the Pastor Kim was speaking about um, what was the word that he used? Um, kind of a divine uh, frustration, if you will, or something like that. Um, so it's kind of, you know, so, you know, I, of course, you know, I took a lot from that. God, the Lord always have a lot of great things for us when we're ready and open and willing to receive. Um, but before that, uh, maybe a week before the conference, the Lord gave me a word and it was kind of a weird thing. It just came out of nowhere. He just, you know, he just spoke in my spirit. Like one day I, was, I just woke up and he gave me this word. He said, do not covet. Am I saying the word right? Because I grew up saying it and I have a different accent. You know, I grew up saying it, covet. And my husband's like, that's not how you say it. It's covet. I'm like, okay, so if I mix the accent, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> It's the Filipino accent. So, COVID, do not COVID. I'm like, I just woke up, I'm like, okay, Lord. <laughs> I know it's one of your commandments. So, what are you trying to say? You know, I'm like, you know, I'll put it aside. Is this something you want me to study on or whatever? I'm like, okay, I'll put it aside. And then he said it again, maybe three more times in the course of the week before we went to conference. I'm like, okay. I got it, Lord, you know, I'll, I'll think about this, what you're trying to tell me later. Um, anyway, so after the conference, you know, I didn't realize that I had a Peter moment. <laughs> you know, the Peter moment, uh, what I meant by that is, you know, when you remember the story of Peter, uh, when the Lord Jesus uh, gathered all his disciples the night before he was crucified, right? They had the, the last supper, if you will. And he was explaining to them what's going to happen. And he said, and, um, and you know what? Uh, one of you guys um, is going to betray me. And I'm going to have to be, you know, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be, you know, beat up and all that. And then when he said that, Peter, of course, I'm paraphrasing. You guys know the story, right? <laughs> and Peter is like, no, Lord. It's like, that's not me. I'm going to go pres I'm to prison with you. I'm going to go wherever you go, right? And he said, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to desert you, discern, uh, the, deny you or anything. And then the Lord Jesus said, <laughs> Peter, <laughs> you know, he said something about, you know, you know, Satan actually asked for you uh, what he meant by that, you know. Um, uh, Peter um, was asked to be tested. And, and then Jesus said, but I prayed for you, that you will not fail, that your faith will not fail. And of course, Peter, is, he has so, con so much confidence in himself. It's like, no, Lord, that's not me. I will not deny you, right? <laughs> and then a few hours after, when Jesus was um, arrested, you know, and Jesus told him, um, before the, the rooster, right, uh, crows, you will deny me three times. He was probably thinking, you're yeah, right, you know, that's not me. <laughs> and so I have that moment, because I was telling the Lord, that word's not for me, Lord. Do not call that. I know what you mean by that, you know. That's not me. 
I'm not going to covet. Because, you know, maybe this word is for somebody else. Then after the conference, I realized that word is for me. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll explain it to you later as we go through this message. And so I entitled this message, Do Not Covet. Just very simple. It's a very simple message. You probably heard this before, but the Lord has given me a different perspective on this. Um, and I believe, like what the past cream was saying, I believe that the Lord is so getting ready to move mightily among us and within us that he's taking us to a whole new level, not only of faith, a whole new level of purity in our walk with him. And so the title of this message is Do Not Covet. Theme is Uncovering the Sin of Covetousness. And so our main scripture is in Exodus 20, 17. Let's go there. And then we're going to pray after we read the scripture. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servants, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your, to your neighbor. It's kind of clear, right? You know, it's, and I'm like, okay, Lord, this, this message is kind of ancient. You know, it's like in the, from the, the old, the Ten Commandments, Old Testament. I'm like, I'm not sure if I really want to share this. But then, you know, with the experience that he, you know, he put me through this last couple of weeks, and I believe, you know, what the Lord is telling me today uh, with, with that experience is something that we can all learn from. And so let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you for this wonderful day, Lord God. Thank you for the breath of life today, Lord God, for waking up this morning, giving us breath of life, Lord God, giving us health. And thank you for uh, gathering your children once again to get to know you more, Lord God, worship you together and uh, serve you together, Father. We pray as we break bread today, Lord God, I pray that you will open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our heart of understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. And so I looked up this word. It's pretty, you know, you guys are probably very familiar with this. Definitions of covet. Covet in just a regular dictionary says, it's a yearn to possess or to have something. And uh, the noun for this word is covetousness. It means feeling, expressing, or characterized by a strong or immoderate wrongful desire for the possession of another, generally construed also as lust or greed um, in the Bible. But let's get to the, the, the biblical definition of covet. Covet is found in, um, that's the reference in the concordance, if you guys want to look it up. The word is comad. And it means to delight in beauty, greatly beloved, delectable thing or precious thing. So desiring something, you know, greatly desire something. Um, and another synonym is, a synonym is desire and lust. And the word covetousness in Hebrew word is betza. A betza know it, right? <laughs> so betza means plunder, unjust, and honest gain. The Greek word for this is uh, pleonexia. That doesn't sound like a drug. You know, I always remember when they have this advertising for drugs. Be careful uh, before you take this drug. Make sure you consult your doctor. It will cause your heart palpitation. It will cause this and this and this and this that. But please take it. <laughs> you just remember me. It just sounds like a drug. Pleonexia. Um, anyways, it means fraudulency, extortion, practice, uh, practice uh, greediness. Now, when the Lord gave me this, you know, I was not definitely covet, uh, coveting my uh, neighbor's husband or, you know, <laughs> their possession or anything like that. 
But when, um, after the conference, I started feeling kind of like what I said, I was inspired at the same time I was frustrated. You know, the speakers were great. All of their um, testimony and all the stories is, is great. They've done great and mighty things for the Lord. They have accomplished so many things and, uh, and all that. And I was listening to all this. I was inspired. And then when I got home, I started feeling this, you know, like a weird thing, like, you know, oh my gosh, Lord, I have not really accomplished anything for you like this, all of these ministers do. I haven't done this, 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 and that. You know, you know, I start feeling depressed about it. I started comparing myself to everybody that were there, and I felt like I was nothing. Like, I'm so nothing, Lord. Why, why you even, you know, why, why am I even here? I've not done nothing for you, Lord. And then the Lord reminded me this word. He just repeated it. He said, do not covet. I'm like, okay. Now I'm understanding what you're trying to say, Lord. It says, do not desire anything of your neighbors. What does anything mean? Anything, right? It's not, the, the scripture actually said specific things. And at the end, it says, anything of your neighbors, any of their possession, anything, um, their husband, their wives, their children, their, you know, anything of theirs, you should not covet. You should not desire what the other peoples have. And you should not, you know, because uh, when you covet, you not just desire uh, in your heart, but also you begin to like, you know, like what I, I felt for myself, you begin to uh, uh, use that as a standard for your own, for your own uh, life, right? It's like, wait a minute, you know, they've done this, this, and that, and I have done this and nothing else. <laughs> and, and then I started feeling depressed. And then the Lord reminded me of this, anything of your neighbors. Now, there's like things I'm not saying, you know, that what you see in your neighbors sometimes inspire you to, to, uh, to do things, right? That's not what I meant here. But the Lord is trying to say that anything of your neighbors, that may include your neighbor's career, your neighbor's talents and skills, your neighbor's dreams and aspirations, your neighbor's habits and attitudes and ways and means and everything else. Because it says anything of your neighbors, their possession and anything that belong to them. Now I'm thinking, Lord, everything that those ministers are saying, you know, I know that you have given Everybody, a measure of grace, right? A measure of his spirit. But I'm thinking, um, am I ever able to even come to close to accomplishing any of those, Lord? And then he reminded me, well, that's be that belongs to them. Why do you covet their, mi their ministry? Why do you covet what they have accomplished? And then the Lord reminded me, don't you think I have great things for you? Don't you think I have enough plan for everybody of my children that you have to covet your neighbors? I think I'm getting ahead of my message. I'm only on the definition. <laughs> All right. And so the nature, let me talk to you about the nature of covetousness. Um, so the nature of covet covetousness is this is, if you recall the Ten Commandments, this is actually at the bottom. It's number 10, the Tenth Commandment. So covetousness starts in our hearts. Um, one of the preachers that I uh, read, art, uh, the article, um, he said, I quote, particularly nature of the Ten Commandment is that it reaches beneath the ex externals of our conduct to the hidden activities of the mind, heart, 
and will, revealing the motives and intents of the heart. So the exceeding sinfulness of covetousness is not that it breaks all the commandments in the heart before they ever committed in an overt act. Isn't that interesting? You know, when I was studying this, I look at the Ten Commandments. That when you look at the Ten Commandments, it really summarized the Lord Jesus said this too in two parts, right? It's really the first, probably first four or five um, relates to man's relationship with God, and then the rest relates to, to man's relationship with their neighbor, with each other. And so when you look at the Ten Commandments, you look at the, it's almost like a priority list, if you will. You know, and if you look at it, it's, it's kind of a, um, the ranking of things, if you will, right? So number one, of course, you have to, uh, do not have any gods other than gods, right? Love thy God with all their heart, their soul, and their might in their, in their mind. And then the list goes on, and at the end, God gave this word, do not covet. And I'm thinking, when I look at the list of the commandments, and I went below that commandment, I'm thinking, this must be important for the Lord to even mention this on the Ten Commandments. Because it deals with the heart. It's a heart issue. So the other commandments, the, the first, you know, few commandments, we can probably say those things you can see on an overt act, things that could be displayed, you know, out in your life. But this sin is something that is hidden in our hearts. We could be committing this sin every single day of our lives. Nobody would know. Is that true? And God always what? Looks at not the outside appearance, but the inside. He always looks at our hearts. And so the sin of covetousness is not the sin that can be fully committed in our hearts even before we act on it. We may not see the manifestation of the sin in a big way, but it can affect our daily attitudes, habits, and goals in life. And let me sh uh, share with you, I've gone in, uh, got into uh, maybe uh, over 10 years of my life, uh, 10 years ago of uh, my life, I got into uh, marketing business. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're familiar with MLM, is that what you call it? Multi-level marketing. Anybody's been there? It was kind of popular in the 90s, the 2000s, right? And so, you know, I got into this business, and of course, I wanted to be prosperous, right? And, uh, and, and the principle, you know, of, of, you know, getting into the business for you to be able to, you know, become what you want to be, right? To accomplish everything you want to accomplish, whatever it is. Possessions, you want a bigger house, bigger car, whatever. You know, and I got into, you know, having all of this American dream, right? <laughs> they said everybody in America should have an American dream, and I do have one. And, and I have a lot of American dreams. <laughs> and, um, and so I got into it, right? And, and in the beginning, you know, they, they inspire you. They tell you, like, you know, hey, you know, so-and-so got this, so-and-so. Look what, what they have accomplished in their life. Look how rich they are. Look, they don't have to be a boss of anybody. They are the boss of themselves, right? <laughs> and so I got, for the, the um, 10 years, you know, I was doing two jobs. You know, I was so motivated. Um, and because, you know, I wanted those stuff that they were telling me it's good for you. I wanted the big house. I wanted a great car. I, I wanted uh, my, a, a fat bank account. I want all that. That's the American dream. And I'm like, wow, you know, I can do this. I can do this, right? So I did. You know, I have some, uh, I would say, a level of success not as successful as I want to be, and I realized in the course of time that I didn't reach the kind of the peak of success in that business, I realized God is protecting me all those times. But even when, when I accomplished all that, you know, because I had, you know, those vision of those people that, that showed me, you know, the people that are so successful, 
doing great and mighty things in life, you know, I'm like, I want to be like that. That's my vision for myself. That's what I want to be, right? <laughs> Isn't that what we do when we were young? You know, first thing we ask the children is like, what do you want to be when you grow up, <laughs> right? And, and, and like, that's, that's me, you know, looking like executive. I have beautiful car. <laughs> I have great house. And, and the Lord was gracious. We were able to accomplish some of the things. You know, we got multiple properties and things like that. We got a big house that we only use one room of the house because it's so big. It's just me and my husband. Um, but anyways, I started, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to uh, use a different word, but I started to, uh, to use that as a standard for my own success. What my neighbors and everybody else that I've seen, I thought, are successful, that's my standard. If I don't get there, that means I'm not close to being successful. So I started changing, you know, the way kind of I, I live my life. I changed the way, you know, I schedule my work time. You know, no more play time, just work, work, work. No more family time, you know, because that will come when you become so successful later on, you don't have to work eight to, to five o'clock, right? Every single day. And so that becomes my standard. So I didn't realize how much of that, that I didn't realize that I was living in sin. Just, you know, just kind of looking at other people, looking at my neighbor's success and trying to want it for myself. And so a lot of times we don't realize that this sin is something we do every single day, right? It's, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, even you, you know, I, I would walk in the restaurant, I would be looking at my neighbors and see which food is the best food to, you know, if, if I don't know the menu, I'm like, hmm, I can smell the other neighbor's food. I'm going to get that. <laughs> That's going to be my meal. I mean, simple things. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to um, exaggerate it, but it's so sim This sin is so subtle that we don't even realize we're committing it every single day. Right? And so Jesus warned us in Luke 12, 15. He said, Take heed and beware of co covetousness, for one's life does not consist in abundance of things he possesses. And in Mark 7, 22, Jesus said that covetousness is one of the ev evil things in our hearts that will defile us and will make us unclean. And not what we eat or what comes through our mouth. Remember that word? Lord Jesus said, what you put in your mouth or what you eat is not what defile you. What defile you is what's in your heart. The evil things in your heart that comes out of you. So covetousness in 1 Timothy, uh, Timothy 6.10 says that the love of money is, is the root of all evil. Remember that word? The love of money, not money. The love of money is the root of all evil. But, it's, but studying this word, now the root is not kind of the very core of things. Before the root comes, there is a seed. Right? And so to me, covetousness is the seed of all evil. Why? I'm going to explain it to you. So in the beginning, you remember the story of Adam and Eve? Right? Um, the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, you got whatever you want to call him, the enemy of our soul. Right? The first thing that he did well, you know, I don't know, they're probably chilling in the garden or something. <laughs> you know, it, things just, just happen, right? The Lord, uh, the, uh, the God, the creator, just created everything beautiful. And um, Adam and Eve, you know, were just born. 
if you will, you know, they were created, but, you know, it's just kind of their first day of life in, in the paradise. And here comes Satan and l- lurking in. And then, um, of course, you know the story, he deceived uh, Eve first, right? And do you remember the word he said, right? Um, he, sh- he showed her the fruit. And then in the word it says that um, Eve sees the fruit as something desirable to eat, right? Something desirable. But before that, the Lord already told them, everything belongs to you, everything you could eat except this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, does not belong to you. Don't eat it, right? But here comes the enemy, and he said, look it. Don't you see it looks good, smells good? (laughs) There's no harm when you eat this, right? And then uh, Eve processing the word of the enemy, and, 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 he started, and she started to feel like, yeah, this is desirable to eat. This looks good. I don't know why I wouldn't eat this, right? And then the enemy said, you know, didn't God really say, didn't he, did he say that you will die when you eat it? You know, like... Um, planting seed of doubt, but really also planting seed of covetousness in her heart because he wanted her to desire something that do not belong to her, belong to them. And you know why Satan, is? this is the first seed that he planted over the hearts of men? Because he is a master of covetousness, Right? You know, if you, see, if you read the story of Lucifer, and um, he said he's probably one of the most beautiful angels that God created. And it's probably, you know, a second hand, um, like the second in command of all the angels. It's not like he doesn't have power. It's not like he doesn't have everything that he needs as a commander of angels. But he wanted more things that do not belong to him. He wanted to be God himself, right? He desired the throne of God that do not belong to him. And so he is a master of this. So this is easy for him to plant. The first thing he wanted to do to humanity is, you know, already destroy it from the get-go, from the beginning. And this is what he did. He planted the seed of covetousness, you know, making... Adam and Eve desire something that did not belong to them. But, you know, I was thinking about it, Lord. You know, if you created everything for Adam and Eve, and, he, and the Lord said, this is all yours, right? I mean, they probably just didn't have time to enjoy it because the enemy is just right there, right? The minute that maybe the Lord just went and take care of something, and then the enemy just, you know, lurked in, didn't give them a minute to even meditate on what just happened, right? <laughs> Planted the seed of sin in their hearts. And guess what happened? You think about it, you know, I meditate on this story for so, such a long time. And each time I meditate on it, there's new revelation that the Lord would show me. Everything, if you want to understand, you know, the Bible, it's, it's coded in Genesis, And so I'm thinking, well, there's really nothing harm with eating another fruit. That's, you know, some people would think like that, right? But that's not the point. (laughs) The point is everything, God has given them everything. Nothing that they would probably want or even think about to want is not there or does not belong to them. They have dominion on everything. But the enemy wanted them to get something that do not belong to them, just like how he did. That's, that's how, he, how he sinned against God. And so I even thought, you know, this sin is one of the greatest sin, sins that Israel committed. You know why? Because at that time, uh, the time of Samuel, you guys remember the story when they wanted a king over them, 
over themselves. Because you know why? They said, oh, we, want, we see all the neighboring nations. They have kings. We want that. Because the Lord would have been the king of Israel all this time. But they, want, I, they wanted the neighbors, you know, what's happening in their neighborhood, their other neighboring nations. God could have been their king from the get-go. God could have governed their nation and would have not gone through all this trouble if they did not covet their neighbor's government or what, you know, their possession and everything else. They are so, you know, they wanted what they, they're seeing on the outside. They're like, no, we want that, right? And the Lord already warned them, okay. It's like, if this is what you want, and he even prophesied and even warned them, if you want this kind of king, this is what's going to happen, right? You know, this is just kind of basic thing in humanity. You, you add power, authority, and money, you give it to a man, guess equals to corruption, right? God knows they're not ready to govern, and, and, and God knows they're not ready uh, to, uh, they're not mature enough to gov govern themselves, but they want a king. And so God gave them the king. First king of Israel is Saul, right? And you guys know the story, what happened. And that's because they coveted. They wanted the neighboring nations. What's happening to them is what they want for themselves. So what's the impact of covetousness? Covetousness can lead to multitude of sin and eventually break all Ten Commandments. James 1, 14 to 15, it says, But every man is tempted when he drawn away of his own lust and entice. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it finished, bring forth death. And so we look at this sin, you know, we think about it, this is not really harmful, right? If, you know, because it's not overtly uh, can be displayed, the, the, the effects of this. But eventually, when you continue to covet your neighbor's possession and everything else that, be, that do not belong to you, this sin is like a seed that grows each stage of your life, and it becomes, you know, a seed of sin for all the other commandments. If you look at all the commandments, right, um, if we can, we can start at the bottom. We can list, can we put the list of the commandments? You guys remember, but I just, I just want to show you because I want to illustrate something. So when you look at the list of the Ten Commandments, if you go all the way down, we're going to start with the Ten Commandment. You shall not covet. That's the bottom one. But if you look at the story of David, right, the Bible said David is, has a heart after God. And the greatest sin he's ever committed is because he was involved and committed the sin of covetousness with Bathsheba, right? That wife did not belong to him, right? It was Uriah's wife, one of his armies. And so he, you know, she, he saw her in the balcony and, you know, desire. He was, he was gazing at her beauty and was stunned with her beauty. And he begins to, you know, like process it in his heart and in his mind, and he began to, like, want to possess her, want her for himself, even though he knows that somebody else's wife, right? And so what did he do? After he coveted, you know, desired, and greatly desired, passionately want Bathsheba for himself, he began to plot, right, a plan, so he began to lie about what, you know, he commanded Job, I think Joab or Job, however you pronounce his name, uh, one of his commander, chief commanders, he began to lie. He's like, hey, you know what, that guy, Uriah, uh, one of our good soldiers, um, I want, he's a valiant guy, you know, he's strong, he's, 
you know, put him in, in the front line, right? You remember that story? He began to um, make the stories of lies. So that's, you know, you shall not bear false witnesses, right? And then you go, um, and then from that lie, then he began to stole Bathsheba from Uriah and had adultery with her, right? So now when you go up <laughs> with this list, so after committed adultery with her, ultimately he got Uriah killed in the battlefield, right? Murder. And when you become a murderer, guess what happened? You dishonor your name. You dishonor your father and your mother's name, the good name that was given to you. And eventually, when you're mur murderers, you have no peace, right? And so Sabbath day talks about God's peace. You will not have peace and rest because of the sin you just committed. And so the next one to that up is when you committed a, um, murder, the, the next four um, commandments is about your relationship with God. Now, when you hated your brother, the, the scripture said, then you hate God. So when you ruin your relationship with your brother, the, the, actually the, the Bible said, if you said you love um, God and, and hate your brother, you're a liar. And so you committed all the sins against your brother. What do you think? The rest of the sin is kind of falls on its place, right? So now the sin of covetousness, even though for us it may be a small thing, it could actually, you know, you could actually live when, when, uh, in this sin. And when it comes to, when it go, grows to maturity, you have violated every law. You have violated every word of the Lord. Are we getting this? So that's why I said, the root, not, the root of all evil is the love of money. The, uh, the seed of all evil is covetousness. And so the third thing I want to point out, we're almost finished. The extent of covetousness. The uh, covetousness, um, oh, that, that's just what I uh, explained to you guys. Um, it will eventually violate all the Ten Commandments of the Lord in its full maturity. Coveting anything of our neighbors, whether good or evil, right? Sometimes there's nothing evil about you looking at your neighbors and kind of, uh, you know, uh, you're inspired with what's happening in their life. Inspiration is different, right? Inspiration, when it leads for you um, to, um, to actually seek God, for the things that be, that, that's for you, then that's good. But if you're looking at your neighbor's stuff and all of your neighbor's the things that belong to your neighbor, including their career, including their possession, including their, their, their skills and talents, and even their, their dreams and aspiration, and even the things that, you know, um, that, are, that doesn't seem like it's evil, the word said, it's simple. <laughs> If you're desiring it so much that you don't even bother to figure out, don't even bother to check with God, if this thing is for you, it be, you know, you make it become, becomes your goal in life. It becomes your, the, the thing that you wanted all your life, the thing that, you li that becomes your life's purpose. To be like that or to want to have that. And so covetousness also in, 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 in the Bible, it will lead you to the sin of jealousy and envy and everything in all types of sin, like what I just explained to you guys. So there's nothing wrong with one thing, your neighbor's stuff. Is there something wrong with that? <laughs> I think there's nothing wrong with kind of seeing, you know, success and stuff as long as you as long as it inspires you to go and seek the Lord for what's, what he has for you, his plan for you. 
because what your neighbors have, that might not be fitting to you. Even, even in ministry, this happens in ministry too, right? A lot of churches say, hey, did you hear what the other church did? We, you know, we got to do that over here, right? <laughs> Those simple things, right? Hey, have you seen our neighbor? Did you see what they just got? I want that one too. Hey, did you look at their, their program? Did you see this church program? I think we got to have that in our, in our, in our church too. Because you know why? You know, did you see the crowd? That's the, the crowd. Uh, they draw the crowd with that program. We got to have that one too. So inspiration is a good thing. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, that you cannot be inspired by other people, but, but with your neighbor's success. Or, as long as it brings you to your, you know, when you go home and you meditate about it, Lord, I know you have said in your word that, you know, I am your child, that all of this belong to me. What we need to do is at that point, when you were inspired, you go, you go to your knees and ask the Lord what it is that he's planned for you, what it is that he wants to give you for anything, for your career, for your family, for your ministry, for anything. Because guess what? The Lord knows who you are, right? Then he created you. Then, then the Bible said he needed you in the womb of your mom. He thought about you even before you existed. He knows every fiber of your being. He knows your every dream, your every aspiration, even before you thought about it. And the Bible said he even knows the number of your hair. You guys get that? And I'm thinking, Lord, can you give me more number? Can you increase the number? Because I'm kind of receding over here. <laughs> That's how much God knows each and every one of us. And I thought about it one time. I, I asked the Lord, because the Bible said uh, something about favoritism, that you can't have favoritism, right? Because you'll be unfair to your other children or, or whatever it is, friends or whatever relationship. And I asked the Lord about this. But Lord, you have favoritism in the Bible. I saw some stories there. You favor some, some of your children. And you know what the Lord told me? I can do that because I'm perfect. I can do that because I can afford it. He can afford each and every one of us his favorite. You are special. Each and every one of us is special to him. Each and every one of us is his favorite. He knows us in and out. So wouldn't you think he has a great plan for each and every one of us? But here's what happens. We're so lazy to find out. We're so lazy to go just even like pray about it. Right? Oh, no, I'm just going to go to church. I'm going to ask the pastor to pray for me so I can find out what, what God's plan for me. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Sometimes the Lord uses ministers, to, but that's really to confirm what the Lord has given you. But if you don't have anything to come with, you have nothing to confirm, and who knows, it could be a false prophet, right? There's false pro prophets around here, right? Not here, but I'm saying out there. And people are not perfect, right? They could be misinterpreting the word, or they could be misinforming you with things. It could be for your neighbor's prayer, it's just that you're standing close to each other. <laughs> They're picking up somebody else's word and giving it to you. I'm, saying that, I'm, I'm not saying that's the ha what happens. <laughs> I'm just making an example. But I'm saying God is so big. He's a good, good father that he has every, every one of us have a great plan. He said, I, have, I know the plans I have for you. What? Plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. He has it in every one of us. Our name is written. Every name is written in the book, Slam of Life, if you believe him. Your life story and your love story is already written in heaven. 
God knows your beginning to your end and anything in between. He knows what's fitting to you, what's best for you. So we don't have to covet somebody else's. Who knows? You, God might have a better plan than the other neighbor. It's like, well, you want that. I got, I got a better plan for you. Right? And so after the conference, I was so depressed, right? Like going back to the story. And then going, um, was it Thursday? Uh, was it? Oh, no, Sunday uh, when we came back. And so the next day, you know, I was committing this sin because I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, I got to do this, I got to do this because, you know, I heard about this. You know, I, this is what I want to do in, my, in the ministry, blah, blah, blah. I started planning everything. <laughs> and then the Lord reminded me of this word. I'm like, oops, I'm committing the Ten Commandment. But it's so subtle, isn't it? It's pretty easy. This commandment is a daily thing. We don't realize how, how we commit this every single day. You know, um, you know why uh, this world is actually ran and operated by this, by this uh, sin, covetousness. You know what they do? That's why, you know, the sales and marketing department and I, all they, they want to do is give you images of, you know, great-looking people, images of great-looking car, images of great, everything great. Because, you know, you know why? They know that you want to want that. When you see it, it's like, oh, that's, that's great. I want that one, right? Everything. Have you noticed the advertising? Or even on the internet, on your phone, just popping up on your images, right? Hey, you can have this, you know? This, and, and you know, the, the most effective and more expensive, uh, most expensive uh, way of advertising is celebrity endorsement. You know why? Because when you have a celebra celebrity that you so love and adored, when they endorse that product, right? When you see them using that or, or, uh, or endorsing it, it's like that must be the, gr a gr the greatest thing on earth. That's what I'm going to have. That's the service I'm, I'm going to call right now. <laughs> or I'm going to have, you know, that commercial about the N NBA, right? <laughs> this guy wearing these big old shoes. It's like it doesn't mean, it doesn't, uh, even though you, you're a fan, doesn't mean you are the player, right? He's wearing these old big old shoes like Barney. It doesn't belong to him. That's not his size. I'm saying God is taking us a whole new level of purity. Aren't you glad the Lord's revealing things? I am glad. In the beginning, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've been committing this sin all my life. I based my, my, you know, my aspiration and dreams for all of my neighbor's stuff and success. Not knowing that the God Almighty who created me and know my every fiber of my being has a better plan for me. And that's what I want. <laughs> but we need to seek the Lord for the things that belong to us. We already know there's a general things, right, that the Lord has for every one of his children. Salvation is everyone of uh, his children. But there's a corporate blessing and there's a personal, individual blessing. And there's a corporate destiny and there's individual destiny. There's, there's one, do you know that there's nobody on earth like you, right? You're unique. Did you know that your worship, nobody could ever worship the Lord the way you worship? Your individual worship. You know, when we went to the conference, um, the most beautiful sound I've ever heard, when all the, the, the music and the band just stop, everybody started um, worshiping and singing their own song out of their heart, their own, their own song. Guess what? Everybody was singing it, but it, it's so, it blended, the voices blended. It's like the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. And the, the Lord reminded me, he said, you know, the best, you know, the best, uh, a worship sound that I'm looking for is the heart of my children. Each heart, each worship is different. But when we come together and sing, that's every song of our hearts becomes like, you know, it's an awesome sound in heaven. You know, um, on, in last Thursday night, the Lord showed me a vision. He said, there's a, you know, 
we all wanted the glory to come down, right? Lord, show us your glory. Show us your glory. But you know what the Lord said? There's a different glory coming from here up to the heaven. That's why the Lord dwells in the worship and the praises of his children. You know why? He already have those glory and stuff from heaven. He knows that. He's familiar with that. But the one's coming from you. That's what he's looking for. That will give him the glory and the worship when you sing out of your heart. The sound coming from the cries of your heart. I'm going to come to close. I'm sorry. Anyways, I got more, but I'm just going to close right now. <laughs> so in 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind can conceive, the things God has prepared for those who love him. You cannot even imagine. You can even fathom in your mind what God has for you. It's so vast and so huge. You can't, you know, this human mind can even conceive it. Are you ready for that? <laughs> but God has to prepare our hearts to receive those. And so I'm going to close with this word. Romans 8.32, it says, Father God, oh, Father God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, uh, for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Don't you think the Father God, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Father God has given his one and only begotten son for all of us. If he gave, uh, gave us Jesus, gave up Jesus, his own son, for all of us, that's the most precious thing to him. He gave it up for you and me. He gave up his blood and his life. Don't you think he's ready to give you anything else? Are we not more valuable, like what the Bible says, are we not more valuable than things of this world to the Lord? We're so valuable, he gave up his own son. Would you give up your son to somebody? Think about it, parents. Would you? God has so much for all of us. You know, the Lord told me, you know, you got to warn my people. That's why I have to share this. I, I have other messages that I wanted to share, but the Lord said, warn my people. You know what he told me? Because we are coming into a season where he's going to bless his people so much that's going to be a transfer of wealth from, uh, from, you know, from the world to his people. And when that happens, guess what? If we're not ready, we can get corrupted. We probably can't even get to where the Lord want to take us. Amen. Are you guys ready for that? I want to invite you to, uh, to uh, um, stand up and we're going to pray. Anybody receive the word of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise your God. I just want to invite you. You know, today we'll just you know, have a moment. Take time to seek the Lord. Because you know, the Lord has so much for us. He's so ready. And the Bible said, you know, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. He's not slow. He's, you're not seeing your promises and your blessings because God is slow. No, we are slow in surrendering. We are slow in, in allowing the Lord to sanctify and purify our hearts so that we can receive all of that stuff that he you know, that belongs to us, each and every one of us, God has destiny for each and every one of us. God has a great plan for each and every one of us. There's plenty. God is so perfect. God is so huge. He's the God of the universe. He can afford to give everything, every, everyone everything. He's unlimited. He's, every, he's eternal. He's not... It's not only unlimited here, it's unlimited forever. So I want to invite you today when we, you know, get into your own homes, you just meditate on this word. Lord, show me 
those places that I'm coveting, Lord God. Show me those, those, um, the plans, Lord God, and, and desires that I have that do not belong to me, Lord. God, I pray that you remove every desire of covetousness, Lord God. Remove all of the, the things that I have placed in my heart that are evil because I have been co coveting against my neighbors and against you for not taking the time to know your will and your plan for myself, but just trying to covet other people's, Lord God. Today, Lord God, I want to receive your grace today, Lord God. Father, I pray that you create in me a clean heart, God, and renew the right spirit within me, Father. And so we pray today, Father God, as we get ready for the things, the mighty things that you want to do in, 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 in and among us, Lord God, and within us, Father, I pray that you, we will surrender, Lord God, because there's no greater plan on earth than your plan for ourselves, Lord God, than your will for ourselves, Father. And so we want to we receive your word today, Father God. We bless your name. We glorify you, Lord God. Out of my own heart, Lord God, I cry out. I just want to invite, invite you to just cry out out of your own heart and worship the Lord.